fascination seduced him to the neighborhood of the stove every now and then, and repeatedly the barkeeper brought him back to the middle of the room and warned him to remain there, but he could not. At three in the morning he again returned to the stove and sat down by a stranger. Before the barkeeper could get to him with another warn warning whisper, someone outside fired through the window and riddled McGee's breast with slugs, killing him almost instantly. By the same discharge, the stranger at McGee's site also received attentions which proved fatal in the course of two or three days. It did not so happen, but still times were not dull during the next 24 hours, for within that time a woman was killed by a pistol shot, a man was brained with a slung shot, and a man named Reeder who also was also disposed of permanently. Some matters in the Enterprise account of the killing of Reeder are worth noting especially the accommodating complacence of a Virginia Justice of the Peace. The italics in the following narrative are mine. More cutting and shooting. The devil seems to have again broken loose in our town. Pistols and guns explode and knives gleam in our streets as in early times. When there has been a long season of quiet, people are slow to wet their hands in blood. But once blood is spilled, Cutting and shooting come easy. Night before last, Jack Williams was assassinated, and yesterday forenoon we had more bloody work, growing out of the killing of Williams, and on the same street in which he met his death. It appears that Tom Reeder, a friend of Williams, and George Gumbert were talking at the meat market of the latter about the killing of Williams the previous night, when Reeder said it was a most cowardly act to shoot a man in such a way, giving him no show. Gumbert said that Williams had as good a shot as he gave Billy Brown, meaning the man killed by Williams last March. Readers said it was a damned lie, that Williams had no show at all. At this, Gumbert drew a knife and stabbed Reader, yeah, cutting him in two places in the back. One stroke of the knife cut into the sleeve of Reader's coat and passed downward in a slanting direction through his clothing and entered his body at the small of the back. Another blow struck more squarely and made a much more dangerous wound. Gumbert gave himself up to the officers of justice and was shortly after discharged by Justice Atwell on his own recognizance to appear for trial at six o'clock in the evening. In the meantime, Reeder had been taken into the office of Dr. Owens where his wounds were properly dressed. One of his wounds was considered quite dangerous and it was thought by many that it would prove fatal. But being considerably under the influence of liquor, Reader did not feel his wounds as he otherwise would, and he got up and went out and went into the street. He went to the meat market and renewed his quarrel with Gumbert, threatening his life. Friends tried to interfere to put a stop to the quarrel and get the parties away from each other. In the fashion saloon, Reader made threats against the life of Gumbert, saying he would kill him and is said that he requested the officers not to arrest Gumbert as he intended to kill him. After these threats, Gumbert went off and procured a double-barreled shotgun loaded with buckshot or revolver balls and went after Reeder. Two or three persons were assisting him along the street trying to get him home and had, and had him just in front of the store of Klopstock and Harris when Gumbert came across toward him from the opposite side of the street with his gun. He came up within about 10 or 15 feet of Reader and called out to those with him to look out, get out of the way, and they had only time to heed the warning when he fired. Reader was at the time attempting to screen himself behind a large cask, which stood against the awning post of Klopstock and Harris's store, but some of the balls took effect in the lower part of his breast and he reeled around forward and fell in front of the cask. Gumbert then raised his gun and fired a second barrel, which missed Reader and entered the ground. At the time that this occurred, there were, were a great many persons on the street in the vicinity, and a number of them called out to Gumbert when they saw him raise his gun to hold on and don't shoot. The cutting took place about 10 o'clock and the shooting about 12. After the shooting, the street was instantly crowded with the inhabitants of that part of the town, some appearing much excited and laughing, declaring that it looked like the good old times of 60. Marshal Perry and Officer Birdsall were near when the shooting occurred, and Gumbert was immediately arrested and his gun taken from him when he was marched off to jail. Many persons who were attracted to the spot where this bloody work had just taken place looked bewildered, 
and seemed to be asking themselves what was to happen next, appearing in doubt as to whether the killing mania had reached its climax, or whether we were to turn in and have a grand killing spell, shooting whoever might have given us offense. It was whispered around that it was not all over yet. Five or six more were to be killed before night. Reader was taken to the Virginia City Hotel, and doctors called in to examine his wounds. They found that two or three balls had entered his right side. One of them appeared to have passed through the substance of the lungs, while another passed into the liver. Two balls were also found to have struck one of his legs. As some of the balls struck the cast, the wounds in Reader's leg were probably from these, glancing downwards, when they might have been caused by the second shot fired. After being shot, Reader said when he got on his feet, smiling as he spoke, it will take better shooting that than that to kill me. The doctors considered it almost impossible for him to recover, but as he was in, but as he has an excellent constitution, he may survive, notwithstanding the number and dangerous character of the wounds he has received. The town appears to be perfectly quiet at present, as though the late stormy times had cleared our moral atmosphere. But who can tell in what quarter clouds are lowering or plots ripening? Reader, or at least what was left of him, survived his wounds two days. Nothing was ever done with Gumbert. Trial by jury is the palladium of our liberties. Palladium of our liberties. I do not know what a palladium is, having never seen a palladium, <laughs> but it is a good thing, no doubt, at any rate. Not less than a hundred men have been murdered in Nevada. Perhaps I would be within bounds if I said 300. And as far as I can learn, only two persons have suffered the death penalty there. However, four or five who had no money and no political influence have been punished by imprisonment. Or one languished in prison as much as eight months, I think. However, I do not desire to be extravagant. It may have been less. <laughs> Chapter 50. Captain Ned Blakely, Bill Nukes, receives desired information. Killing of Blakely's mate. A walking battery. Blakely secures Nukes. Hang first and be tried afterwards. Captain Blakely as a chaplain. The first chapter of Genesis read at a hanging. Nukes hung. Blakely's regrets. These murder and jury statistics remind me of a certain very extraordinary trial and execution of 20 years ago. It is a scrap of history familiar to all old Californians and worthy to be known by other people of the earth that love simple, straightforward justice. I'm encumbered with nonsense. I would apologize for this digression, but for the fact that the information I am about to offer is, is apology enough in itself. And since I digress constantly anyhow, perhaps it is as well to eschew apologies altogether and thus prevent their growing irksome. Captain Ned Blakely, that name will answer as well as any other fictitious one, for he was still with the living at last accounts and may not desire to be famous, <laughs> sailed ships out of the harbor of San Francisco for many years. He was a stalwart, warm-hearted, eagle-eyed veteran who had been a sailor nearly 50 years a sailor from early boyhood. He was a rough, honest creature full of pluck, and just as full of hard-headed simplicity, too. He hated trifling conventionalities. Business was the word with him. He had all a sailor's vindictiveness against the quips and quirks of the law, and steadfastly believed that the first and last aim and object of the law and lawyers was to defeat justice. He sailed for the Chincha Islands in command of a guano ship. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> he had a fine crew, but his Negro mate was his pet. On him he had for years lavished his admiration and esteem. It was Captain Ned's first voyage to the Chinchas, but his fame had gone before him, the fame of being a man who would fight at the dropping of a handkerchief when imposed upon him and would stand no nonsense. It was a fame well earned. Arrived in the islands, he found that the staple of conversation was the exploits of one Bill Noakes, a bully, 
the mate of a trading ship. This man had created a small reign of terror there. At nine o'clock at night, Captain Ned, all alone, was pacing his deck in the starlight. A form ascended the side and approached him. Captain Ned said, Who goes there? I'm Bill Noakes, the best man in the islands. What do you want aboard this ship? I've heard of Captain Ned Blakely, and one of us is a better man than t'other. I'll know which before I go ashore. You've come to the right shop. I'm your man. I'll learn you to come aboard this ship without an invite. He seized Noakes, backed him against the main mast, pounded his face to a pulp, and then threw him overboard. Noakes was not convinced. He returned the next night, got the pulp renewed, and went overboard head first as before. He was satisfied. <laughs> a week after this, while Noakes was carousing with a sailor crowd on shore at noonday, Captain Ned's colored mate came along, and Noakes tried to pick a quarrel with him. The Negro evaded the trap and tried to get away. Noakes followed him up. The Negro began to run. Noakes fired on him with a revolver and killed him. Half a dozen sea captains witnessed the whole affair. Noakes retreated to the small after cabin of his ship with two other bullies and gave out that death would be the portion of any man that intruded there. There was no attempt made to follow the villains. There was no disposition to do it, and indeed very little thought of such an enterprise. There were no courts and no officers. There was no government. The islands belonged to Peru, and Peru was far away. She had no official representative on the ground, and neither had any other nation. However, Captain Ned was not perplexing his head about such things. They concerned him not. He was boiling with rage and furious for justice. At nine o'clock at night, he loaded a double-barreled gun with slugs, fished out a pair of handcuffs, got a ship's lantern, summoned his quartermaster, and went ashore. He said, Do you see that ship there at the dock? Aye, aye, sir. It's the Venus. Aye, aye, sir. You, you know me? Aye, aye, sir. Very well, then. Take the lantern. Carry it just under your chin. I'll walk behind you and rest this gun barrel on your shoulder. Pointing forward. So, keep your lantern well up, so as I can see things ahead of you good. I'm going to march in on Noakes and take him and jug the other chaps. If you flinch, well, you know me. Aye, aye, sir. In this order, they filed aboard softly, arrived at Noakes' den, 